something for me, just to get me get me ready to do this, because I still sometimes, it's butterflies now, there used to be like pterodactyls in there, um, so I still need to get pumped up. So when I say poetry, you say slam. Poetry. Slam. Poetry. Slam. No, are you guys grade 12, sir? Yes. Oh, come on. Pump it up a little bit more than that. When I say spoken, you say words. Spoken. Words. All the way up, it's only a little bit of exercise. When I count down three, two, one, I want you to say, show the love. I know it's weird, you just met me, but do it anyway. Three, two, one, show the love. I'm gonna make you do it again later, just because that wasn't very good. <laughs> um, I want to introduce what I do uh, to you. Um, I am a spoken word poet, or a slam poet, um, and I am so incredibly passionate about this art form and about what it has done for me and how it has completely changed my life uh, in so many ways. And um, I, I was sort of deciding which poems that I wanted to share today. And um, I know you probably have already had your bullying prevention week and had all those talks, but uh, this poem um, that is called Weapon of Choice uh, just has a special place in my heart. And um, it's become such a special poem to me uh, with the help of three wonderful young men that you have right here at this school, um, Teddy, Tibor, and Brad. And give them a round of applause. Um, for you to just be able to see what it's like to follow a passion and to help people along the way and make a positive difference and that's what I'm doing with this poem so I'd like to share it with you today. It's called Weapon of Choice. You guys see the Hunger Games? Yeah. I don't understand this hunger from a book about kids killing kids. When we bear witness to these scenes of violence on a daily basis, it's true. We like to think that it all happens at a distance, that the stories jumping from newspaper headlines aren't about the heads lined up for class in the school next door, that the horrors of weapons drawn by teens are just fiction spawned for screens and the victims gone to sleep eternally could never be our own sons and daughters. See, it's into movie theaters we pour or line up outside bookstores waiting for the chance to put pages in our hands that describe a world where young people are sent away to play a game of survival. But can you not see? Our own youth vie for their lives from behind computer screens, entering cyber arenas that often become battle scenes. We fail to take notice as children clutch weapons in hand and click. Target found. Click. Insults abound. Click. Self-confidence drowns. Click. Next time no one's around. Click. Six feet into the ground was the body of one who lost the game. Unable to remain a target forever, they take their own lives before their enemies ever get the chance. Yet we praise the young girl heroine who clutches a bow and arrow in her hands, picking off their competitors with precision. How would we feel if the weapon she brandished was a mouse? Her arrows would still find their targets. So would it be any harder for us to cheer for her if she killed her peers with a weapon we could find inside our own house? Would it be too terrible to realize that our children slay each other with words daily, insults hurled like hand grenades, cursing each other to early graves, yet we say names will never hurt you? I think maybe we should adopt the practice of lighting up our sky like a television screen, showing the bright eyes and smiling teeth of every child that's ever been erased from this earth from bullying. Do you think then that we would pay more attention? If faces replaced base statistics of victims, if we saw clearly each and every face that would never wake to see another sunrise? Boys and girls who think taking their own lives is better than being hunted in hallways and online, yet we sit satisfied reading our books and ignoring the cries of children stalked like prey. Harassed for being ugly, stupid, or gay, so the real world is less like a hunger game and more like pure cannibalism. Bullies feed off each other. As hate spreads like a cancer, entering through the eyes and ears and making its way to the most delicate organ of them all, which is the heart. Bitter remarks tear into lining, taunts and jeers sear through tissue until eventually the heart dies alongside self-confidence and the hope that things will ever change. See, there's not much difference between laughter and slaughter. So when LOLs become SOSs, will we hear the cries for help or be stuck in our own fantasy world plucked from a shelf where kids kill kids with weapons? Don't tell me that's any better or worse than kids who kill kids with words.
like I said, I think I, I, um, I know you've heard those messages before, um, but what's really inspiring about a day like today and being involved with a day like today is that you get an opportunity to um, have people presented to you um, and hear people speak and share their stories. And really that's what it's about. It's, it's what I am so passionate about doing, though, sharing my stories, about hearing other people's stories and using poetry as the way to find my voice. And I really encourage anybody, whether it's poetry or music or rap or football or any of the things that make you feel like you're you and make you feel like you're able to be the best person that you can be, you can be find those things and hold on to them because they're very important. And, and hold on to those people around you that support you no matter what you do because um, there were certainly friends of mine that were like, poetry, really, of all the things you could have chosen. Um, <laughs> we don't want to be friends with the poet, that's a little bit strange. Um, but, uh, you know, I, it's just been an incredible journey. And uh, so, like I said, I want to share um, one more piece with you as an introduction to spoken word. But also, um, this is one piece that um, I was asked to write it for TEDx Waterloo, and it really encapsulates some really important parts of my story. Um, it doesn't tell my whole story, but it tells some of it. And the three parts can really be broken down into um, the one part is that the sooner and the more often that you can look in the mirror and say, you freaking awesome. Um, it's really powerful. It's really amazing to be able to do that. And you're not going to be able to do it every day. I still can't do it every day. But the sooner that you can do that and you can enter the world every day, not apologizing for who you are, surrounding yourself with people who accept you for exactly who you are, that's incredibly powerful. Um, the second part of the poem talks about those things in life that just happen to you that you don't have any control over and those things will happen. And being able to, again, find those people Find your voice inside to be able to get the help that you need to go get through those and then use those experiences to empower you, um, which is the third part, um, which is finding those things again um, in life. For me, it's poetry. For you, I don't know what it'll be, um, but finding those things that just really let you be yourself and, and find your voice. And uh, do the things that scare you, because like I said, public speaking, it was pterodactyls, now it's just butterflies, I can deal with that. Um, but just do them. If you feel like something's calling to you, just go out and do it. And use today as the inspiration. So um, I'll leave you with one more poem. It's called Chasing Home. <clears throat> Ask a young child to draw his house. More often than not, he will put pen to page drawing a structure with windows and a doorway. He will say this, this is my house. Ask a young child to draw her family. She will scribble stick figure silhouettes, crayon creations of siblings, parents, and pets. She will say, this, this is my family. Yet ask a young child to draw home, and you may find that the picture then shows both. For home is a mix of people and place. There are so many ways in which we define it. Often, the only way we can find to describe it is to say home is where the heart is. So let me tell you where my heart has been. First, picture two streets. One lonely set of stoplights marks where they meet. There are no fast food chains or big box stores on these corners, just Karen. Truth be told, I never knew if it was her orange vest or her smile that stopped the traffic. Crossing guard extraordinaire, Karen was just one of the many familiar faces I grew to know in my hometown, a place filled with small town charm as infectious as the chicken pox we all caught in kindergarten when people ask where I am from. I smile shyly and reply, you probably won't know it, and it's true, because though there are some who may know my home's name, they will never know her like I do. My heart belonged to dusty forest bike trails and street hockey showdowns, to cornfields and home-cooked meals and my elementary school playground. We played made-up games because, well, there was honestly nothing else to do. But we played those games until our shadows disappeared and the streetlights called us home. I called those streets home until I started to learn their secrets and began to keep some of my own. I don't know exactly how it happened, but at some point, I fell in love for the first time. And though I'd like to say it was as perfect as a Hallmark Valentine, there are reasons beyond being 16 that this wasn't the case. For most, first love marks a coming of age, but for me, it was an inability to come out and tell anyone her name, so she and I made new homes inside our closet. Knowing small towns and words like gay fit together like puzzle pieces picked from different boxes, it was the first time I started to not feel at home in my own skin. My body became an expert at holding things in as I swallowed secrets like confessionals consumed sins. The small town I grew up in morphed into a place 
I couldn't wait to escape from. So I began to dream of a new place to call home. One where I could hide in the shadows of skyscrapers bigger than the secrets I was stockpiling in my lungs, bigger than the lies that were jumping so easily from my tongue. I wanted to shake hands with strangers who didn't care where I came from or who it was that I loved. And so I went where any small town Canadian kids struggling with their identity would go. I packed my bags and I moved to the city of Toronto, home to people of all shapes and sizes, all colors and creeds, and you better believe I found home, wandering those streets lined with shops, displaying approval not for sale, but given away freely. It was right there in their storefront windows. Stickers of big old gay rainbows. And so I started a collection. I put a glass jar in my heart and I filled it with acceptance, examples of stickers and stories and moments that all told me it was okay to be me. And eventually I cashed in that courage. Counted out exactly enough bits of bravery to say, Mom, I'm gay. Oh, and happy Mother's Day. <laughs> and not exactly how Hallmark drew it up. But my family's words of love were like cups of hot water pouring over the fear that had kept my mouth frozen closed. And though I'd like to say this is where the story ends, I had another lesson to learn about hearts and homes. It came when I heard the word divorce over the telephone. I was 24 years old, and in that moment, I learned some things when broken, hurt worse than bones. I wondered when my family fell apart. Why didn't I hear a sound? I wasn't given time to prepare, to take my heart underground before the disaster hit. I was sitting in a 19th floor apartment, needing to know what had happened, but not wanting to return to survey the damage. It's funny, when I did, I almost hoped to see that the walls had caved in, or that the roof was gone. Something that could be repaired with some muscle and a toolkit, and I'm not saying these would have done the trick. But I knew the shards of hearts left shattered on hardwood floors would be so much more difficult to fix. Eventually, we did. We licked our wounds and somehow made it through, and I'm not saying there aren't scars. But what are scars but just beauty marks saying, I brought my heart to a knife fight and life may cut deep sometimes, but damn it, I'm still here. And I'm here, I take a hustler with all of you today, because I finally found home in a place I never imagined. One where people get on stage and share poems. And I don't mean like roses are red, I mean like people have bled their hearts out onto paper, put tears, secrets, and hopes in the mix, and then shared it with a room full of strangers. Am I crazy? Absolutely. But when my stories are exposed, belted out under bright lights and amplified through microphones, I hope someone out there will think I'm not alone. So next time you find yourself a bit misplaced, seek out a space where words and hearts are being shared, pull up a chair and take a peek at the back corner of the room. You may find me there, pen in hand, scribbling out my next poem, be sure to come say hello. I'll smile at you like a child and say this. This is my home. Thank you guys.